This is Twit. You write uh, that for a long stretch, WWDC felt largely like an iOS developer conference, but last week uh, felt like WWDC should be what it should be, an Apple developer conference. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, I, I just think, uh, I, I mean, it, I, it goes back to the uh, history of the iPhone, really, that, you know, even in 2007, when the original iPhone was going to ship, there was a press release Apple issued that just said, hey, we were going to ship a new version of Mac OS X. I forget what version it was, you know, it was 12 years ago. But hey, we pulled up uh, a bunch of key engineers. We had to put them on the iPhone. It's our top priority. Mac OS X, whatever it was, is going to be late. And, it, you know, it shipped in November instead of June. Um, but ever since, it, it really has seemed like for as much money as Apple has and as big a company as they are, they, they've they been, it's been difficult for them to walk and chew gum at the same time is the uh, the phrase that's been used thousands of times. <laughs> uh, and I really thought last week at WWDC, this was the first WWDC where it really felt like all of the major platforms, especially to me, Mac OS in combination with iOS, but watch OS and TV OS too, they're, they all moved forward in lockstep. The Swift UI, which is to me the long-term, the biggest announcement that they had last week for developers, it, it's launching it on all of these platforms at the same time. You can use Swift UI on the Mac, iOS, watch OS, TV OS all at once. And that's just not how Apple has debuted things in the last since they've become a multi-platform company. Usually it comes out first for one of the platforms, usually iOS, and then in years later trickles down to the other platforms. And I really feel like they've got the ball rolling on uh, keeping everything moving forward in lockstep. So what has been the catalyst then uh, to drive them to be able to do that successfully this time if they haven't done this you know, effectively in such a long time? Why now? What What has changed about now that makes this possible? I don't know. I, you'd have to ask, you know, they're, they're so secretive about what they do internally yeah. and why they've had such a difficult time doing that. I don't know. Uh, I think part of it, though, is that Swift UI was conceived from the get go as being this uh, foundation layer for any and all platforms going forward for, for specifying the user interface for software. So, Cal and I think that's What's different. Like, yeah. So Catalyst was uh, that's a way of porting the iPad apps to iO to uh, Mac, um, but you also say that in some ways this is already depreciated. Um, yeah, talk a little bit about that. Well, so in very broad terms, uh, starting all the way back at, at the Next Step era when it was Next Computer Company in the late late eighties, early nineties. AppKit was the fundamental framework that you used to make apps for the Next computer system. When Apple acquired Next and sort of reunified the company with Steve Jobs and his leadership team, they really got two things. They got a new leadership team, Steve Jobs and his trusted lieutenants, and they got the Next software. And the Next software revolved around AppKit. AppKit is just basically the fundamental framework that you use to write apps for the Mac. And it was what you used to write apps for Next, you know, AKA Coco. That's the name they gave it to, to give it a sort of consumer friendly name. Uh, when the iPhone debuted in 2007, it didn't use AppKit. It used something new called UIKit, which was basically a new version of, U of AppKit built for touch and also designed by people from the next team and from the AppKit team to sort of look back at, at, at that point 16, 17 years of AppKit and say, what would we do differently? And UIKit was always very, very similar and familiar to AppKit developers. So Mac developers could move to iOS. And in the early years, like 2007, 2008, 2009, um, a large number of iOS developers were coming from the Mac. And it's sort of like a gear that turns one way, though. It, it Going from AppKit to UIKit was very familiar and relatively easy going from the other way if you started with ui kit and going to app kit uh, a lot of developers found it difficult it was or at least tedious and unfamiliar because it was ui kit in some ways is easier it's a 
sort of a tough word to say with developing applications, but let's just, you know, keep it in broad terms. Um, and so Catalyst is a way for UI kit developers, people who know how to write apps for iOS, to, to port their apps to the Mac without learning AppKit and sticking with UI kit and do, hopefully doing a lot less work and maintaining one code base. Um, and I think that's great. I, I think it's probably a good idea that they shipped it. But I, I say that it's already deprecated the year that it debuts because Swift UI is, I think, it, it's certainly intended to be the future of UI programming for all of Apple's platforms. Uh, and I think it will be. I mean, there's some chance you never know how things will play out. There's some chance that developers will reject it. I, I don't see that happening, though. So I, I feel like five years from now, there won't be many people writing new apps for either AppKit or UIKit. They're all going to be using Swift UI, whether it's for Mac or iOS. Hmm. Um, shifting gears a little bit, one thing that I that I was kind of struck by, because I, I follow definitely Google and Android side a lot closer than I do the Apple side of things. Uh, a month ago, Google had its developer conference, Google I.O., with an intense focus on artificial intelligence. Just like I, AI was everywhere. It's basically like, hey, we have all your data. We're doing all these crazy things with AI, and you're really going to love it. Um, and then Apple, you know, Apple's event, they seemingly take a lighter approach to AI. I feel like a couple of years ago, there was more emphasis on AI, and we still have Siri, of course. But um, there's a, a lot lighter of a touch with AI uh, from from Apple right now, why why do you think there's such a difference? And do you think that maybe this hinders the potential of what we're seeing in Siri uh, compared to some of the competitors? What do you think? Well, I, I think they're a little they're certainly late to the AI game. Google, you would have held up as the corporate leader in artificial intelligence, uh, maybe as as far back as almost as far back as Google goes, you know, certainly from the very early days of the company. Um, and, you know, much like Maps, and Maps in some way is, uh, you know, is under that AI umbrella, you know, mm -hmm. because a lot of what we want to do, I mean, some of the work with Maps is just the hard work of putting cars out on the road and driving millions and millions of miles and taking millions and millions of pictures and documenting everything. Some of it is just, just hard work. Uh, and there's catch up to be done on that front. But a lot of what we talk about maps now is very much about AI. It is about talking to your assistant and saying, here's where I want to go. I want to get there by public trans transmit transit, or I want to drive, or I want to walk, or Tell me what to do. Tell me if I should walk or take transit and uh, and then tell me what to do to get there. That's AI. Um, I don't think Apple takes it any less lightly than, than Google now. I just think they're slightly behind because they got started later. And I think hiring John, and I'm going to butcher his last name, JG, <laughs> John Gian, uh, whatever his name is, the former head of Google search, who's now the head of AI and machine learning at, at Apple, that's a big signal. Uh, and I, I, they talk about it less because they talk about the experience more. But a lot of the features they're talking about are AI. Apple spent a lot of time in the keynote last week talking about the update to photos. And they had, uh, and again, I don't have his name in front of me, but they had one of the engineers on the Apple Photos team using his own personal photo library. And you could tell it like his kids looked exactly like him. It wasn't one of these like fake photo libraries shot by a professional photographer, which is a lot of times what Apple does, you know, it's, is they'll load up a demo and the photo reel is shot. They may actually be photos. They are actually photos shot with an iPhone, but they're shot by a professional photographer of professional models in beautiful beaches and mountains and stuff like that. Instead, this guy was showing his real family photos. And the way that the iOS 13 Photos app can now organize your photo by months and years and, and collapse... And, you know, you can go to a view to see all of your photos, but it looks like they want you to default to a view where it's going to skip things like screenshots. And if you have uh, seven straight shots of a young kid blowing out the candles on a birthday cake, they're going to, using AI, you, you know, just sort of pick the one that they think is best and put that in the view as you scroll. So I, I just think they don't talk about it being AI. I think there's, there's a lot of features they're using that, that are driven by that. And I think we'll see more and more of that as, as time goes on.